wonderful for a brain of the year to manifest what a brain really is. It's not just a studying machine. It's multiply intelligent. It is sensory. It is physical. It is loving. It is socially intelligent. It is personally integrated. It is externally it is ethical, it is spiritual, it is creative. The brain loves, perhaps more than anything else, other brains, other minds. Look at families, and what do they love most? The members of the family. And the more they can do, the more they can flower their multiple intelligences the more wonderful it is. So earlier on, the brain was thought to be disconnected from the body. <coughs> so intelligent people were not physical. And people who did sports were often called what? Boneheads. Boneheads. <coughs> Dunces. Thick jocks. Although sport is an astonishing intelligence. So the Brain of the Year Award was conceived and then given to those who manifested multiple intelligences, who were in love with humanity, who loved to teach other people, who loved to spread good knowledge to help others. So that's what a brain of the year was. So it's not just the brain. The entire body and spirit is the real brain. And that is the brain of the year award. And you will be as delighted as I that there are a number of brain of the year winners here. And they are going to talk to you about, for them, you know, what does it mean to be a brain of the year? And what is the brain? So it is my great delight to introduce to you brain of the year, Dominic O'Brien. But how do you justify being brain of the year? So that was my con initial concern. Don't worry, I soon became comfortable with it. <laughs> uh, and then I, I rationalized and I thought, well, this is a, a validation, really, of all the hours, not just hours, but days, weeks, months, years, I put into this crazy pursuit, which was trying to cram as much information into my brain as possible in the shortest possible time. That was the goal. And the, and the tools for doing that was a, a deck of cards and some numbers. And I can tell you, it's a very lonely pursuit back in 1987, because I thought I was the only person in the world mad enough to do this. And it was quite disconcerting for family and friends, you know, six months into this. Well, Dominic's still at home, he hasn't got a job. Um, he's memorizing hundreds of packs of playing cards. We were all terribly worried. <laughs> no good can come from this. <laughs> and uh, even when I did become uh, the first World Memory Champion, uh, some members of the press, not all of them, were saying, well, what is the point in doing all this, memorizing thousands of numbers and packs of playing cards? And then I realized that actually I was exercising the whole of my brain, and I said, well, what is the point in running 400 meters around a track going around in circles? Um, why should 22 fully grown men try and kick a ball from one end of the field to get in a net at the other? It's not crucial to our survival. There is no point in a ball being in the back of a net. It's not the ball being in the back of the net that's important, how it gets there. 
That's the art and the science of any sport of football, javelin throwing. So it's not the order of a deck of cards in my head that's important, but that's the art and science of memory. And more than that, it revealed to me the very essence of the learning process. And uh, years later, I, um, I came across the work of the Hungarian psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, who studied great sportsmen and women and artists and poets. And there was a common theme running through them, which I identified with, which was you lose sense of time. The activity that you're concentrating on is all engrossing, it's all encompassing. It's so important that everything else becomes secondary. And I can remember looking at my watch, it's four o'clock in the morning. I thought it was about seven o'clock in the evening. And I hadn't eaten since lunchtime. So you, you, you lose sense of time. You don't need to sleep, you don't need to eat. You have to do what you do. When people say to me, well, how do you become a world memory champion? How do you get that, um, that drive? And it's like being on a conveyor belt. You just, you can't get off it, and you don't want to get off it until you've completed the task. So, what does it mean to me? Well, obviously I've exploited the uh, brain of the year. It's taken me to countries I would never have dreamt of visiting in the first place. We've talked about Lithuania, we to uh, Nicaragua, uh, Vladimir City. Why would anybody want to go to Vladimir City? And recently, Iran, Tehran, and there I am talking to a conference hall of delegates, businessmen, government officials talking about the brain of memory. So it's given me tremendous opportunities. But I think at the top of the tree it comes to passing this knowledge on, passing the techniques to children, to schools. And it's nearly 10 years ago that Ray, Tony and I co-founded the UK Schools Memory Championships. And with the help of Phil and Chris Day we've uh, taught thousands and thousands of children around the UK and we're exporting this to China and the rest of the world. And the thing about children is um, they love to play games, they love to play the game of memory, and they love titles, they love champions. So when they see me, my name coming on, a world memory champion, brain of the year, the first question is, do you have the biggest brain in the world? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's all about um, learning some very simple techniques, and I've trained my brain. And if I can do it, and I always show them my school reports, show me as being a dyslectic dunce, couldn't concentrate, couldn't memorize anything. If I can do it, you can do it too. And I had a wonderful conversation with this wonderful gentleman, Said, yesterday. We're talking about the world run by mathematics, and it's all about hooking into formulas. And if you can find the right formulas or something, you can achieve success in anything. So that is my message to school children, my message to you today. This dyslectic dunce can become a world champion, a brain of the year. You are all potential champions. You're all potential brains of the year. So thank you, Brain Trust. It's been a hell of a journey. <laughs>
and support. Uh, the worldly things, the spiritual things, educational, humanitarian, sisterly and brotherly, egohood. So, uh, so I'm very grateful to that. And uh, I'm grateful to the great man. He's on my right. Uh, the Honorable Tony Bezan. And you, you are the Honorable. And uh, in the next our event in the House of Lord, please make a note. 28th of 20th. Se September, 20. That will be Tuesday. So I think Lady Mayor would be a best person. Now she is the vice chairman. And, and behind the scene, you know, the, the honorable, the right honorable, His Excellency, Ray Keen, you see, that uh, his presence is very important to us and we click uh, to our friendship, our brotherhood, respect between us. And I think that this encouragement and this brain of the year activity should continue and spread uh, in, in all over the world. And thank you very much indeed giving me time. Thank you. Thank you. Another delightful human being who worked and works on the whole future of the planet, on the nutrition of the brain, the food for the brain, and is an example of what a human should be as a human being progresses through life and maintains the newness of research into the brain, into nutrition, <clears throat> even founded and runs the world leading foundation organization on the human brain, the chemistry of the human brain and nutrition. Professor Michael Crawford. I'm not going to, but I want to reiterate Dominic's concerns about being given this award. <laughs> um, I also want to reiterate your deep expression of humility mm. and the wonderment of this whole idea that you have created for the Brain Trust, which draws attention to the supreme significance of the brain. It is astonishing that the thing that makes us different from apes is the brain. And so little attention is being given to the brain. To the extent that the evidence from that state is that the number one burden of ill health worldwide is disorders of the brain. Number one. Mental ill health is the foremost cost to the burden of ill health. In the United Kingdom it costs more than heart disease and cancer combined. And this has happened in the last 30 years. And Andrew Sinclair and I predicted it in 1972, which your newspaper, the Sunday Times, reported on a review saying that unless something was done to address the issues that we had <coughs> raised about nutrition of the brain, those words were, we become a race of morons. Those are printed indelibly the pages of the Sun Saudi Times, 5th of November 1972. And the tragedy is that nobody has paid any attention to it, despite the fact that it was 
the evidence we had accumulated in 1970 was reiterated by a joint Food and Agricultural Organization, World Health Organization expert international consultation in 1978, 1994, 2008, and 2010. Yet this whole crisis, which is undermined humankind, it undermines our ability of being human. And there is so much inhumanity today that you can see the consequences of that inhumanity increases as mental ill health increases, it spells the end of humanity and the end of homo sapiens. So we are facing the greatest crisis ever that humankind has faced. Now, just to backtrack a little bit about my own personal history. When I was a child, and my father always wanted to celebrate, and he would take us to celebrate at a restaurant, a little pub on the shores of the Firth of Forth, called Cramondin the mouth of the river Crum. And the food there was renowned throughout Edinburgh as the best seafood on the planet because the proprietor would go down in the morning and collect seafood from the foreshore. And you had fresh crabs, you had fresh lobsters, you had fresh fish, all sorts of things that he had collected that day. 1965, I returned from Africa and I said to my brother let's go on a trip down memory lane to Cromondy. Uh we went down there beautiful July summer's evening let's go and have we parked the car let's go and have a look at the foreshore and the, see this wonderful steel bridge that you have at the foot across the first of all. we walked down there and the first thing that confronted us was a massive Yellow Department of Environment notice saying, Warning, danger, muscles unfit for human consumption. In my lifetime, this phenomenal resource of brain food being destroyed, the brain evolved in the sea 500 million years ago, using, this is what Andrew and I did, published in 1972 using marine nutrients and it has used the same today for its construction and its signaling systems and we can discuss the details of this in quantum mechanics as to how that actual intimate relationship with the evolution of the brain in the sea 500 million years ago is still a determinant of our brains today. Now. I'm not going to talk about all the statistics about things, but I have here to show you a rather dirty tea towel that somebody gave to me, which tells all about the problem of today. And by converse, it tells about the solution because we can reverse what has happened. And it says this, off the Pentland Firth, the sea was one third water. Now, the Pentland Firth is the Firth of Forth that I'm talking about. Off the Pentland Firth, the sea was one third water and two thirds fish. That's quite unbelievable. The operation of taking them could hardly be called fishing, for they did little more than dip for them into the water and take them up. This, ladies and gentlemen, this, ladies and gentlemen, is a quote from no less than Daniel Defoe. <laughs> <laughs> and it was written in 1705. This is what has been destroyed worldwide. The restoration of this can not only actually 
cancel out the emissions of carbon dioxide because this was capturing carbon dioxide. We were eating it. We were putting the oyster shells into our backyards. And it was taking the carbon dioxide out of the system. This has been destroyed worldwide, estuary-wide. You restore that, you restore carbon dioxide fixation. Cancel out the emissions of today that are causing global warming and provide food for the brain. So I want to praise the Brain Trust for helping to enable us to bring these issues to the forefront and to be a part of the movement, the new movement that has to take place to rescue what is happening now, <coughs> the biggest crisis of all, of mental ill health in humankind. Thank you, Brain Trust. So now also the next Brain of the Year, <coughs> an artist. An artist who focused on explaining what art was. And the artist who won the Brain of the Year combined all the multiple levels of human intelligence. Ray wrote her first biography and it is Lorraine Gill who inspired imagery and color in mind mapping thinking, helping all teachers to teach children to learn how to learn. And Lorraine is also born in Australia, so many uh, Australians here. And Lorraine painted that by brain, by hand by hand, the global brain. So I give you the great honor of being in the presence of Brain of the Year, Lorraine Gill. Thank you. Thank you, Brains Trust. When I first learned that I'd been given the Brain of the Year award, I simply didn't believe it on two counts. One count was from whence I came, because there is a saying in Australia, it's called cutting the tall poppy. We don't really like to see people moving ahead and higher than the other. It's the egalitarian society. It's mateship. So culturally, you're conditioned to think, oh, I don't want to be better than anyone else. I'm not going to say I've won anything, which may pe make people think that I'm better than anyone else. And so that was my first reaction uh, to having been told the news. The second was that no artist is thought of as an intellectual, because art, as everyone is supposed to know, is self-expression, <laughs> and we paint out our feelings. <laughs> it all comes <coughs> from the heart and with no sense of rules or grammar or intellect or science or art or mathematics or geometry or biology and the rest of the known fields of knowledge, which, if anyone had seriously thought about it, art is all of that. It's the study of nature. It's the basis, Sherlock Holmes, observation is the crux of all knowledge. As an artist, you observe, you sharpen your perceptions. There is an entire world in a face. Each time that you look at an object with the changing light and you question what that object means, it takes you into the world of infinite knowledge. So, what is light? <coughs> that simple question, what is light, takes you into physics, takes you into the universe, takes you into geometry, mathematics, everywhere. Plus, 
your chosen craft. What is colour? How does colour interact with your perception? How does colour make you feel? In even building your own canvas, you have to have the craft of understanding the organic nature of the canvas that you're dealing with, how it will interact with the environment, how you take care of it. All of this is even before you place a mark. Now, that's the other major point. What does a baby do as it is evolving to come to terms with its environment? It's usually, isn't it? It begins to make marks. It's this interacting with the environment to understand the environment. It is the first leap into perception and finding out about the world around them. The making of marks, the evolution of mankind, the first marks that were made, which over evolution finally became plans for great cities. That first making of the mark was the beginning from the ape into finding out about the environment to understand it, to then evolve to alphabets, to language, henceforth. So what was the role of the artist? It wasn't all of this. It was an intellectual being, a serious artist, who was contributing to the knowledge of the world. And not only that, but passing on that knowledge to children. In my extensive years of teaching in colleges and universities, most people have stopped learning to draw or had by a teacher or whatever <coughs> by the age of five been not inspired to go any further to learn to draw, even if they had wished to. So over the years, <coughs> I looked into the nature and the study of the visual grammar and devised a system whereby I can now teach people of any age to draw within two weeks. And I consider that, even though art is an underdog, to be a major contribution to the globe today because, as I've been told, what has art got to do as a contrib contribution to the world? Well, we are perceiving human beings. It sharpens your perception. Perception is the basis, the key to survival. If we are perceptive, if we pick up on body language, if we see what's ahead of us, if we note all the time that we are alive, alive with our perception, we are awake. Now, being awake is the key to survival and the key to knowledge. Now, from the humble origins of an artist, that is what I learned. And when, thank you, Brains Trust, for acknowledging that an artist can contribute globally to perception and the evolution of the human being, I honor you and I feel vindicated in all of those years of being invisible as an artist. So I thank you, everyone, for listening very much indeed. Thank you. The brain of the uh, candidate <clears throat> obviously is checked on all the elements. And in this area, teaching, the new brain of the year, the kind of combination, and is a brilliant educator. On one level, primarily a teacher, and teaches thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people, and does it in multiple, multiple, multiple ways. And the 
the nominee, also discussed by all the brains of the year. And it was a unanimous decision that this, this candidate should be the one. Um, this particular one fights for intelligence and fights on it on all levels and spreads out the information, lets the world know about what intelligence is, about what art is, about what memory is, about what nutrition, the brain, <coughs> is, what poetry is. All of this encapsulated in the unanimously chosen candidate. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, the qualifications, a humorist, a total, a person who a thing when you are with, you will always laugh. You will chuckle deeply. One of the healthiest things you can do is to laugh, which exercises all the systems. And the new brain of the year, definitely one of those. Uh, the love of intelligence spreads to spiritual, to ethical, um, to caring. And it's not just for <coughs> humans. It's not just the human brain. It's for intelligence. And that includes, very importantly, animals mm -hmm. and the extraordinary intelligences of animals. Also, engineering, Leonardo da Vinci, you know, if Leonardo da Vinci had been here, he would have won, <laughs> obviously. <clears throat> so engineering and the engineering candidate also, and the ability to observe, to care for, to portrait, ideal, involved in physical activity, active, all senses alert, as Lorraine was saying, and alive. Uh, and Marek here is going to take portraits of all this and is organizing the filming and the photography of the winner. <clears throat> and therefore, princes, excellences, honor companions, Prince Marek and the one plus one equals one. He's going to take selfies. <laughs> 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 Prince Marek <laughs> has, <laughs> has organized carefully, mechanically, mathematically, musically, rhythmically the, the, the portraits of the brain of the year and the two in one are Prince Marek and Princess Trina. <laughs> you are one. <laughs> Uh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think it would be a surprise. Yes, you were correct. And the award, the award is just behind them. Just behind them. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Is the, the global brain painted oh, hand free by Lorraine. So that is yours. And we know you have to go back to Australia, so we'll make sure that it's got to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. <laughs> My goodness. So may we celebrate the brain 
of the year. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> just imagine what he's done. I mean, just synapsia alone in terms of for the brain of the planet and the future. And that's just one of the many things Marek has done. Gosh, um, accustomed as I am <laughs> to public speaking, <laughs> I honestly say I do not have a speech prepared. <laughs> So, um, good. It, um, I, I'm very, very sorry, but my speech will be much shorter than the others. I apologise. Uh, on behalf of uh, Petrina and myself, obviously, thanks to the Brain Trust. It's um, thank you, Dominic. How am I possibly going to get away with this? <laughs> <laughs> The company that I keep here and that we now officially keep is extraordinary. Um, Prince Mohsen Ali Khan, um, the Lorraine Gill, Dominic O'Brien, eight times world champion, who will never, ever be surpassed. How can I beat that? Professor Crawford, when he speaks, everyone should listen. Everyone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And the company we keep is amazing. Um, and I can only hope that your kind recognition of us and our enthusiasm in what we do and how we associate with such beautiful people will inspire us to do better and do great things for global mental literacy and for the Brain, brain Trust. So for all of you who unanimously <laughs> were so kind um, to consider us, thank you T so much. Tell them about your teaching. Tony wants me to tell you about my teaching. I do. <laughs> I enjoy teaching very much. <laughs> I he causes trouble in universities because of his teaching. Because there's too many people. I am very passionate with my teaching. I teach Bachelor of Business and I enjoy it so much. I love going to work every day. I love it. And I love being part of the privilege of these students learning. I don't teach them, I encourage them. I love the Socratic method of teaching. Socrates, question, answer, question, answer. Let them discover and guide them into that area. And um, I like to use technology. I record video podcasts. So my students, when people on the train think they're just grooving to some music, they're watching my lecture. <laughs> and I love the fact that they they use the technology. I had a lecture I wrote, and I've written 300,000 words of lectures in the last couple of years. And I made a dreadful grammatical error. Dreadful. And it took three years for a student to point it out to me before I corrected it. Three years, and that got me thinking. I must deliver what I need to deliver in a way that my students are going to embrace. So I set up a little studio and I started delivering video podcasts. And if I didn't get it out by 4 p.m. on the day I promised, I would be flooded with email, flooded. Not three years, three seconds. And so the message is getting across. I'm passionate about what I do in education, and I hope I impart that to my students as well. And I hope that that passion also I will bring to the Brain Trust, to the World Memory Sports Council, and we will definitely support it and give it every single um, ounce of our enthusiasm 
and professionalism as we can. Tony's prompting me to tell his stories that I perhaps may not tell in this company, but um, <laughs> in doing Synapsia, when I scanned all the years of Synapsia to put them in electronic format, I read every single article and I loved it. I loved all of it and it was a privilege to have all of those magazines. And so Petrina wrote an article in the current, current first Synapsia, the Phoenix Synapsia, um, about our dog Molly. <laughs> Molly is a cross between a Marema sheepdog and a Doberman. She's a very intelligent dog. She's not allowed on the furniture. She's a big dog, a big dog. Two hands when you're walking her, two hands. And so she's not allowed on the furniture, not allowed on the bed. However, when we come home of a night, there's a little nest on our bed. It's Molly size, nest. And she looks at us with these sheepish eyes. So we decided to put up a little video camera and uh, and turn it on and we decided to leave the house for half an hour. The camera was working. When we came back we noticed our bedroom still, quiet, door closed. Molly trotted around the bed, nosed the blinds over and peered down the street, quite ceremoniously, peered down the street. We reversed out the driveway and we drove off and she looked and she looked, and she looked, and then she waited, jumped on the bed, <laughs> made a circle two or three times, and dropped. <laughs> we came home, we were to discover, and the intelligence of this dog astounds me to this day. She quickly pricked up her ears, they're home, they're home. She jumped off the bed, walked down the corridor, past the garage door in the opposite direction to misdirect us. So when we opened the door, she was coming from the opposite direction to greet us. It wasn't me. Animal intelligence, it's everywhere. Thank you very much. I'm Prince Marek and this is my wife Princess Petrina. My goodness, we've just been announced as Brain of the Years for 2016-2017 and we were absolutely shocked. We were not expecting this at all. We had nothing prepared and we feel such an incredible honour to be given Brain of the Year and it's now inspiring us to do good in the world of world mental literacy and uh, are very honoured but still a little bit shocked about this wonderful award. Thank you very much Brain Trust. Thank you.